see you. Uh, this is lecture three. Uh, as a reminder, we're in our opening module, our opening circuit. This is about an intro to economics, and it's about thinking like an economist, okay? And we are challenging ourselves, we're pushing ourselves, not just to understand what economics is as a definition, but what economic thinking is as a toolkit, okay, as a framework to systematically analyze issues, make predictions, make sense of a messy world. Okay, there's a lot of things out there, mysteries, you know, riddles in the world that the lens of economics helps us to understand. You know, last time around, we figured out um, why, even though cars are safer, more people are dying in car crashes. And we figured out that a little tweak in the incentive structure was able to get, uh, was able to vastly improve the chances that a British prisoner would make it to Australia. Okay, so we've been talking about um, some of the key tenets of economic thinking. We left off last time with the idea of marginal costs, marginal benefit analysis. Today, I want to move the discussion now over into a little bit more into trade and into markets. Okay, so let's continue on and talk about how economists think and some of the big tenets, the big ideas, the, the, the hallmarks of economic thinking. Um, in economics, you will learn this over and over again. We'll keep repeating it. We believe in the power of trade. Trade is one of those things that a lot of people really love and a lot of people really loathe and protest against. And you know, there's a lot of backlash to trade increasingly. In economics, however, we believe that voluntary trade, note the term voluntary, okay, nothing forced. No, this is not about human trafficking or exploitation. Voluntary trade, we believe in economics, creates value and ultimately leads to win-win outcomes. I think that one of the reasons why people kind of, some people don't like trade is we oftentimes use sports and other analogies in our world. And one of those analogies that we use is the win-lose analogy. If there's a debate, if there's a, a, a wrestling match, if there's a boxing match, if I'm gonna win, you're gonna lose. And if you're gonna win, I'm gonna lose. That's a certain category of outcome. We call that a win-lose outcome. It's also called a zero-sum outcome. You should use that term because when your parents are dropping like 50 grand for Zoom University, at least you got to use big terms and sound smart at dinner, right? So we call that a zero-sum game. And a zero-sum game, again, is for me to win, you have to lose. And if you win, I'm going to lose, okay? But that's not the case with trade. Instead, my friends, I would offer to you that trade is a positive-sum game. And a positive sum game is a win-win game. We believe in economics that voluntary trade creates patterns of win-win. Let's tie this into the utility and profit incentives that individuals and firms seek. Let's tie it into the bigger picture, okay? We believe that voluntary trade creates value and a win-win outcome, okay? And let's, let's do a simple example as to why. You know, before I came back in here to U-Haul to record this thriller of a lecture, I stopped at one of my favorite restaurants for some fine Mexican at Del Taco. And I paid, I don't know, about seven bucks for, uh, got a couple burritos, got a taco, got a big Coke, okay? Let's think about this. I voluntarily paid, let's say like, I don't know, seven bucks or so, right? Expensive lunch. I was paid about seven bucks and I got a couple of bean and cheese burritos, you know, a couple of tacos and a big Coke. Do you think that I would have walked into that trade and given away my $7 voluntarily if I thought I was going to get screwed in the process? And the answer is clearly not. You know, I'm, I'm at least somewhat intellectual. I, I, know, I, know, I know how to judge a burrito. That's why I go to Del Taco, right? If I'm going to voluntarily give $7 in exchange for that food, I had, my friends, I had to have decided beforehand that the marginal benefit, the utility that I was going to gain from consuming that awesome Mexican food far outweighed the $7 that it cost me. I made an incentive-driven 
rational decision based on marginal analysis to buy that food. And I firmly believe that my utility for that food was like at like $12. I got $12 worth of Mexican food goodness for only $7. I won. Now turn the tables to Mr. Del Taco guy. Do you think when I left, he said, damn that Eric Young. Every time he comes in here, he screws us over. Do you think that he would sell me something again at $7 knowing I'm going to lose money on this guy? Of course not. He clearly sold it at $7 and that was a price that not only covered all of his costs of production, his land, labor, and capital, his workers, his machines, his tortillas and beans and stuff, but also built in profit. He voluntarily sold me that food at $7. So he earned profit while I also earned utility. That trade was a win-win. We both came out better. And therefore, that voluntary trade, by creating win-win, it created value. And ultimately, economic thinking is thinking about how to increase the value, the, the goodness of life that people can enjoy. Okay? So, we believe in economics strongly in voluntary trade. In economics, we are always thinking about how institutions and markets can foster more trade and more trust. And we always ask the question of, you know, what are some of the, the prerequisites to good trade? We also in economics believe that you have to be very skeptical of any approach, of any policy that attempts to artificially restrict trade. So if, you know, on top of closing down the gym, our local mayor said that, nope, you, you, you can't have Del Taco anymore, he would have been blocking a win-win trade. That would not have made me better off because I gained $5 of benefit from the trade. And it also would not have made Mr. Del Taco better off, he would have lost profit. So we believe that voluntary trade creates value and therefore we look to foster more and more and more trade. And we believe that restrictions on trade should be eyed very, very carefully because they block those win-wins, okay? Very big idea in economic thinking. An extension of that is a definition, economic surplus. An economic surplus can simply be defined as the benefit of taking an action minus that action's cost. Oftentimes, it's easy to calculate when you're talking in terms of money. You know, I can say, oh, that I, would, I would have paid 12 bucks for that Del Taco. I only had to pay seven. I came up ahead by $5. And maybe Mr. Del Taco guy says, I was able to buy all these raw materials for only $4, and I sold it for seven, so he got a profit of three. Okay, so you can quantify this, but you don't have to. The broad idea, economic surplus, is the gains to buyers and the gains to sellers through trading. And it's defined as the difference between the benefit of taking an action minus the cost of taking an action. And notice that this ties back into our idea earlier in the previous lecture that you always take action when the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost. Because by doing that, you generate surplus, you generate value, you gain utility, and you come out of the trade better off, okay? Let's do an example here. Let's assume that you have $50, money is scarce, you don't have infinite amounts, you have $50. There are two items that you wanna buy. One is a pair of shoes, which you have judged will bring you $80 worth of happiness, okay, and nice shoes. And the second is a ticket to a Wu-Tang Clan show. Clearly you're a bit of a marmaluke here because you're only judging the woo as bringing you $65 worth of happiness. So your musical tastes really suck, you need to up your game, but I'll let that go for now. We'll work on it later. But let's assume that for the moment, you decide that the shoes would give you $80 worth of happiness and seeing the RZA and the uh, Method Man would only bring you $65 worth. Because both items cost 50, you can only purchase one. So which one do you purchase? And again, you think this is not an economic question, Eric. This is, this is just common sense. Yeah, it is. Ultimately, you're trying to maximize your economic surplus. So you would probably buy the shoes. The question then of how much economic surplus will this bring you? Well, the shoes are bringing you 80 worth of happiness. You're paying 50 for them. 
So we would argue that your purchase of those shoes would yield you $30 of economic surplus, consumer surplus in this case. I'm guessing we could also suspect, we can also you know, probably guess that the guy who made and sold those shoes was probably able to put them together and to bring them to market for less than 50. So again, you gained surplus because your value exceeded the price you paid. The seller probably gained value in the form of profit because the price he received was probably more than his cost of production, okay? So we know now how to use the marginal benefit, marginal cost rule. We know how to calculate economic surplus. It's the difference between basically the amount that you're willing to pay, the benefit of an action, and what you actually paid in this case. In the case of this example, you're gaining $30. An important question, what is the opportunity cost for that purchase? And the opportunity cost is the chance to see the Wu-Tang Clan, which would have been a great night for you. But what are you going to do? You want to choose instead. Okay. Notice that you couldn't have them both. And with your scarce dollars, you had to pick one path or the other. You logically picked the path driven by your rational pursuit of utility and incentives to go for the shoes. You had to give up the Wu. Okay. That's that. A couple other things tied to the idea of economic trade. Um, information is very important in trade. Having information on everything from product location to product quality, product safety, all of those issues of, in, of information are very important to economic trade theory. We also believe, though, that like any other resource, information is scarce and costly. It's that information, as well as a few other things like geographical distance and, and, and basically distribution networks and things like that, that constitute what we call transaction costs. A transaction cost is basically defined as the cost that you have to take on to make a trade possible. You know, it could include, from the, from the buyer's perspective, the, the search cost for information. From the seller's perspective, it can include the, what it, how much it costs to bring the product to market. Okay? All of those transaction costs ultimately serve as barriers to trade. And again, because we want to maximize trade, because we want to maximize win-win transactions, we're always looking for opportunities to reduce transactions costs. Sorry, transaction costs. Middlemen have historically played the role of reducing those costs. So like middlemen, you know, salespeople, uh, brokers, merchants, all these people who buy and sell for a living who act as middlemen play a very valuable role in economic trade theory because they reduce transaction costs by bringing buyers and sellers together by minimizing search costs, and a good, a good middleman has good information to help the trade go through in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a fluid manner to maximize well-being and surplus, okay? Today, we can see that middlemen are really, really, uh, they bring a lot of profit in. Um, think about what Amazon does. Amazon is basically a high-tech middleman. They bring buyers and sellers from across the world together with their star rating. They're, they enable you to get information on what product to buy, but not buy it from that vendor, but buy it from that vendor, right? So we see that as trade becomes more valuable, but as information becomes more costly, middlemen provide a valuable service. And in our modern economy today, they profit for that. We see middlemen everywhere. Amazon's a great example, but you know, Yelp, a middleman. It gives information that helps a buyer say, do I really want to go to that restaurant? Will the burritos be really good or might I get E. coli, right? I'm guessing, I discourage this, but I'm guessing that at least a few of you before you signed up for either my class or some other class went onto one of those fancy websites that serve as middleman and provide ratings for people like me. So you can figure out, oh yeah, that class is easy. Guy's a joke, take that class. Oh, that guy gives a lot of homework, skip that class, right? From a professor's point of view, it's kind of a pisser, but from an economist's point of view, it makes perfect sense because you would not want to go into a transaction with a lack of information. So you seek out that information. And some of those websites or some of your friends who've taken classes with me before, or other professors, they provide low cost information. It all goes back to helping you maximize your economic surplus, okay? Finally, let's continue on with some of our key tenets. We believe in economics that competitive markets are a great way 
an effective way to organize economic activity, okay? We're gonna speak on markets a lot more in a later lecture, but for now, let's just assume and define a market as any mechanism that brings a buyer and a seller together. And therefore, markets make trade possible. Now, competitive markets in the, in the lens of classical economic theory provide even more benefits to that. They require the effective use of resources, they minimize costs, they do a lot of other really, really good things, which we're gonna cover in detail in our micro section. But for now, just know that economists believe in competitive markets. Economists also believe in the importance of economic growth and economic development. Economic growth is a major question that plagues economic, that, that plagues uh, economists. The questions of why is this country rich and this one not? Why was this country rich a century ago and now they're stagnating? Why was this country, which was you know economically backwards 60 years ago, now a global leader? Okay, those are critical questions that economists really focus on. We'll discuss that in more detail in our macro section, but for now, just know that economic growth is critical because at its core, economic growth makes people better off. I am not saying that money fixes everything. I am saying this, if you grow up in a wealthy country by almost every metric of human satisfaction, from lifespan and health to literacy and years in school to the rights of women and minorities to vote and be in a political process, all those metrics tend to be better in richer countries. That is why countries are always aggressively pursuing economic growth. I'll give you some examples when we have you know, uh, live lectures with each other about what happens when countries don't. But if you look at like North Korea, South Korea, you know, during the Cold War, East Germany, West Germany, you can see very, very clear evidence in these natural experiments of what happens when countries accelerate their growth as opposed to when countries don't. So then the final question, well, not the final, another question that we talk about in economics is, if economic growth is important, how does it happen? And this is where we move into the idea of institutions. Economists believe in the power of institutions. Institutions are, you know, they, they, they're broadly defined. They can be things like, you know, the university system, a legal system, competitive markets are an institution. All these different kind of cultural and legal constructs that basically make an economy and a society what it is, comprise its institutions, okay? We believe in economics that good institutions are critical because at the end of the day, good institutions lead to good economic growth. Almost every modern successful economy has underneath it good institutions, okay? What are those institutions? Well, there's a handful. They include things like, um, a very strong and fair legal system. They include, um, let me get rid of that. They include the rule of law, um, the institution of contracts. You, you, you never think about that, but imagine what contracts are and imagine what contracts, well, imagine what without contracts. Contracts basically say that you can jump into a transaction without even knowing the guy on the other end, like when you buy something on Amazon, because you have faith, you have trust that that transaction will carry through, okay? So the power of contracts, the rule of law, um, we can consider trade an institution, a good monetary system, a system that um, handles money in a good way and doesn't cause hyperinflation is also an institution. So there's lots of institutions, some economic, some legal, political, some social but we believe in economic theory that they matter, okay? Among the institutions that are the most important to economists is this one, the institution of private property rights, okay? In economics, we are, at least in capitalist economics, the idea of private property rights 
is crucial. In fact, a lot of people would argue that the existence and the protection of private property rights is one of the fundamental institutions that has made the, the handful of global economic superpowers superpowers. They value the rights of private property, okay? This is an important institution. You have to remember that at the end of the day, when people trade, it's ultimately the property rights of the item that change hands. So property rights, they facilitate trade. But beyond that, they provide lots of other benefits. I'm going to take a minute to delve into them. We're going to identify um, three things that property rights involve, and then also some of the incentives and benefits. Okay, So let's start with what property rights involve. When we say that you have property rights, what does that mean? The first thing, um, property rights involve, ready, the right to the exclusive use of a property, including the right to exclude others. So property rights involve exclusive rights to the property, which includes, and a lot of people don't like this, but it includes the right to exclude others. Okay, so number one, property rights uh, involve the right to exclusive use of the property. Um, including the right to exclude others. So we'll say exclusive rights and I'll say exclusive use. Um, the second thing, private property rights imply that there is legal protection against invasion from those who seek to use or abuse your property without your permission. Okay, so there's a protective function in property rights as well. Okay, so property rights are the exclusive use of the property. In addition, legal protection against those who wish to use or abuse your property without your consent. Okay, and number three, and this is the one that makes the most sense from an economics lens, but it's just one of three, property rights also involve the right to transfer or sell or exchange or mortgage the property, okay? So transfer is the right to, we'll say, sell it, exchange it, and I'm gonna put this thing here, the idea of mortgaging it. Um, a mortgage is, people think about them as house, you know, as, as a house loan, but a mortgage is a broader economic concept. A mortgage is effectively a loan that is taken out with a piece of collateral. Um, imagine, a society without property rights. You could not mortgage. You could be, a, a, you know, imagine you're in some, you know, poor country with no real property rights. Um, you know, the government can come and take your land at any time. It's not even really your land because you don't have any exclusive title to it. Not only that, let's say you have a great idea for a business. You have a chance to make some money to feed your family, but you need a loan. Well, you can't get it because without the legal right to your property, you don't have the right to mortgage it and no bank's gonna give you a loan without collateral. So you can also see that property rights are a subtle but critical part of our entire financial system because the number of loans that are collateralized, home loans, business loans, those loans allow our economy to grow. So these property rights provide valuable, valuable benefits, okay? Um, with that said, what are some of the incentives? Because at the end of the day, we know incentives count Property rights lead to incentives. Um, number one, incentive number one, the owners can gain by employing their resources in ways that are beneficial to other, okay? So the first way that private property rights create incentives is that the owners of property, they can employ their assets in ways that will be beneficial to others and at the same time, they will bear the cost of either harming others or of not serving them, okay? So private property rights align my incentives with those of other people. So common thing that we're gonna see in economics, the idea that an individual's pursuit of gain can align with societal well-being. Private property rights help do that. Because if I know that I can gain by employing my resources for profit, I have to be thinking of 
A, meeting your needs and also mitigating any harm. Um, number two, owners have a strong incentive to care for and properly manage what they own. I think we would all agree that in a world of scarcity, taking care of resources is critical. Private property rights provide the owners with an incentive to care for and take care of their resources. If you don't believe me, think about the last time that you, if you ever borrowed a car or rented a car. I'm pretty sure that you drove that borrowed car in a far more dangerous way than you would drive your own car. Ownership matters. And when you don't own something, the incentives of preservation and care go away. The third thing, owners also have an incentive to conserve their resources for the future. This is a weird one. We think that people who own resources want to you know, burn those resources up. That's not always the case. Owners actually have an incentive to conserve their resources for the future, especially if the owners expect them to be worth more in the future. You can imagine the incentives. If a business owner or a property owner thinks that this thing might be worth more money in the future, they've now got every incentive to take care of it. Okay. And finally, owners have incentive to lower the chance. So let's say this, lower the chance of harm. Owners have an incentive to lower the chance that their property will damage or harm other people. Because tied to the private property rights and the access to gain the benefits of that property or that asset, you're also accountable for the harm that that asset causes. So all these things together lead to a powerful system where owners have the really strong incentive to take care of resources, to conserve them, to steward them, to use them well. This does not happen when people don't own resources because all those incentives go away. If you don't believe me, think about this. The last time you went to a park or a beach, you probably saw a lot of litter, but you don't see litter in your own home. Well, because you own the home, you have incentive to take care of it, right? Your own car, you drive it kind of carefully, you keep it clean. Your friend's car, you know, you wipe your dirty hands on the seat and you spill your Coke. It's not your car, what the hell do you care, right? You don't care if you inflict harm on it, it's not your asset, okay? So again, tied to incentives, this idea of private property rights really tweaks the incentives in such a way that the individual self-interest aligns with society's self-interest. Okay, together, these ideas of private ownership and the presence of a competitive market get this down here for you. Together, the idea of private ownership and property rights, together with the presence of a competitive market that brings buyers and sellers together, it provides the foundation for cooperative behavior among individuals. And that, when you think about it, is a phenomenal statement. The idea that in a world of millions and millions of people, each pursuing their own self-interest, the pursuit of my self-interest need not be an impediment to somebody else's. But instead, if there's property rights and competitive markets, the incentives will align such that the pursuit of my self-interest benefits not just me, but society. We have this network of small level, millions and millions of small level trades and transactions and interactions every day in our global economy. This is an amazing amount of cooperative behavior among us. And it all comes down to good economic institutions, okay? So we always focus on those. A couple of more small pieces about how economists think. I'll give you two more and then we'll call it a day. Um, economists distinguish in terms of the tenets of economic thinking between the long run and the short run. This is kind of arbitrary, 
But for later analysis, it's going to be really important to bear in mind that economists look not just at activity, but at activity over time windows. And there's subtle differences between those time windows, okay? We define in economics the long run as a time frame that is sufficient to adjust, okay? This is very new. If you've done accounting classes, for example, if you've done tax classes, you know, you just think of long run, short run, it's a year. Then that's the cutoff. It's a year. Less than a year, short run, longer is a long run. That's not the way it is in economics. In fact, in economics, you can have a long run that's, you know, six weeks. You could have a short run that's 35 years because the actual amount of time, chronological time, is not important. Instead, this long run, short run distinction, it comes down to adjustment. The long run is a time frame that is sufficient for economic decision makers, individuals, businesses, households, firms. It's sufficient time to make adjustments. The short run, on the other hand, is defined in economics as a time frame that is too short to make adjustments. Here's a simple example for you. Suppose that um, after this thrilling lecture, you decide to go franchise a Del Taco. You got at least one customer, right? Suppose that when you franchise that Del Taco, you're locked into a five-year contract that you have to pay a franchise fee for five years minimum. Doesn't matter how many burritos you sell, for five years, you're on the hook. That's your short run. Your short run is five years because you cannot adjust, meaning you cannot get out of that contract, okay? Suppose that you've taken on a, a side business selling fake IDs through Zoom out of your, you know, now you used to be out of your dorm, out of your parents, out of your bedroom at home, right? Your short run is basically like, inf it, it's, it's immediate. You don't have any real fixed expenses. You know, as soon as the coppers come knocking on your door, you can just throw all your shit in the trash and you're out of business, right? Look at Boeing. Boeing makes airplanes, right? Those airplanes, they're built in these huge hangars that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build. The lifespan on a Boeing airplane manufacturing facility is 35 to 40 years. That's Boeing short run, 35 to 40 years. Because once they commit to that project, they can't just say, ah, we made a mistake and just shut it down. They're locked into this valuable costly asset for 35 to 40 years. So in economics, the long run, short run, we're not going to be thinking about time frame like chronologically. We're going to be thinking about adjustment windows, okay? And the final thing that we talk about in economics, this is really more of a macro thing for our macro section, but it's important. Economists focus on real values. You're going to hear us talk in economics about nominal values and real values. And the basic idea, we'll do some math behind it later, but the basic idea, it's about inflation, okay? Inflation refers to an upward rise in the price level over time. Because of inflation over time, a dollar is worth a little bit less than before. As you can imagine, if the overall price level goes up, then $1 buys you less today than it bought you 20 years ago, right? So if we're talking about the value of a dollar, we just can't say a dollar because we don't know what we're talking about. A dollar today, a dollar a long time ago. You know, um, if you take a look at, you know, you look at old salaries for, for old baseball players, you know, I think Babe Ruth, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, he made $80,000. But he made that money like, you know, a long, long time ago. You can't compare the salary that Babe Ruth made of $80,000 a long time ago to the salary that you might make today because of the time thing. You know, maybe you have one of those parents who's really crusty about, you know, gas prices. You know, back when I was your age, gas was a nickel a gallon. Well, yeah, but at the same time, the price changed, but inflation changed and income changed. So you have to make adjustments so that the comparisons are worthwhile. That's what this is. Nominal values are the face values of any variables, variables typically being prices and price level, FYI, but there's lots of them. It could be salaries, it could be wages, it could be a lot of things.
things, okay? Nominal values are the face values of variables measured in their current prices, and they are not adjusted for inflation, okay? In economics, we don't like nominal values because they don't really tell us a story. You can't compare a dollar today to a dollar 100 years ago because the buying power has changed due to inflation, all right? So we have to make an adjustment. That adjustment from going from nominal to real is what we do. Real values are the values of variables measured in prices that have been adjusted. or inflation, okay? So in economics, whenever you're given a, a series of prices or any other kind of variable, you always wanna make sure that you're talking about real values. These are values that have been adjusted to account for inflation and the change in the price level and buying power. If you wanna make comparisons over time, you have to compare apples to apples, right? That's a real value. If I compare my salary today to my grandfather's salary however long ago, that's a crappy comparison because I don't know what his salary would have bought. That's apples to oranges, okay? So in economics, we focus on real values and we always convert from nominal to real when we're gonna make comparisons over time. The tools to do that are very simple. There's some basic, honestly, subtraction and division math. It's not hard. And we'll learn that probably around week seven, okay? Anyway, friends, that's it for our third lecture. At this point now, you know what economics is, you know the definition, but more critically, you know some of the tenets, some of those tools in the economist toolbox. Decisions and opportunity costs, marginal analysis and incentives to make those decisions, right? The way that we can gain surplus when we can consume something that brings us more value than it costs and how trade facilitates those economic surpluses and that markets and the underlying institutions make those trades possible. And therefore, trade and markets and institutions are critical. We learned that um, private property rights give lots of benefits and, and they facilitate that trade and that cooperation. And then we wrapped up with a couple of ideas on um, long run, short run, and real versus variable values. Just some technical things so that your toolbox stays sharp, okay? At this point now, my friends, you have a pretty good idea of what economic thinking is about. Our fourth and final lecture in this module will be a quickie, and it will be talking about not good economic thinking, but bad economic thinking. What are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the errors that people make when they don't think? correctly. And that'll be our fourth and final lecture in this first module. Okay. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're having a great day. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Take care.